Okay, so in today's video, I'm going to be talking to you about this aircraft here. This is Hewing's newest aircraft. This is their T1 VTOL PMP. Um, and as the name would suggest, with it being a PMP, this is an aircraft which is pretty much ready to fly when you buy it. Um, in fact, technically, the only thing that you need to do to be able to fly it is a very, very small amount of assembly um, and also add a receiver. Um, now you would also probably want to add FPV gear to it. I mean, I certainly did add that to mine. Um, but other than that, I mean, yeah, this aircraft, you can put it together in about sort of like 20 minutes and then you can take it out to fly. Um, for those of you that built one of these aircraft yourself last year, and I did do a tutorial showing how to do it, you'll know that pretty much the hardest part of building this aircraft was doing the programming in RD Pilot. Um, it's just very, very confusing and very complicated using RD Pilot. Um, especially if you've never used it before. Um, but one of the key selling points of this aircraft is it actually comes with a flight controller pre-installed and the RD Pilot programming has already been done, or at least most of it. Um, so yeah, this is you know, an exciting new product. Um, it's very cool to see that you can now buy one of these uh, T1 VTOLs basically pre-made. Um, but what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna basically kind of talk to you a little bit about my experience with this aircraft, because I've had it for a couple of weeks now, um, and let you know, is it really a PMP aircraft? Can you really just buy this and get it in the air quite quickly, or do you actually need to do quite a lot of work? So I think to start off, what we'll do is I will show you the unboxing, because I did film that, and obviously you're gonna to wanna to know, if you buy this aircraft for yourself, what, what do you get for your money, and what kind of condition does it arrive in? So what I'll do is I'll cram myself down in the corner down here, so I can then show you some of the unboxing footage. Um, and then, yeah, we'll work through that and then I'll show you the build and you know I'll show you some of the flight footage. So as you can see, the aircraft arrives in a box which is very similar to the original generic He-Wing T1 aircraft. Um, in fact, the only real difference is the box is very slightly bigger and the fact that it says VTOL across the front. Um, but when you open the box, you then see a very familiar sight. Uh, there are three boxes inside. Um, as with all heat wing products, they're just packaged really, really nicely. Um, and so each of the boxes contains, you know, obviously different parts of the aircraft. So the first box here, uh, this is the one that contains the fuselage. Now, the fuselage itself is identical to what you'd get in, you know, a generic heat wing T1 uh, PMP aircraft. Um, there's nothing different going on here, sort of cosmetically, you know, the fuselage is exactly the same. Um, but the key difference is, is in the electronics that have been installed. So as I mentioned a minute ago, this does come with a flight controller pre-installed, and you, know, you can see it down here. Now there's not a lot of information online about this flight controller. It is a He-Wing branded flight controller, and as far as I can tell, it's got an F405 chip in it. Um, but other than that, I haven't really been able to find a whole lot of information. Um, as you can see, everything is done via plugs, so there's no soldering required. And um, as you'll see in a bit, Hewing also provides you all the wires with these plugs on as well, so you, know, you literally don't have to do very much with regard to that. Um, and underneath the flight controller, there is a little like power distribution board thing kind of going on, the same as what you would have got with the original Hewing T1. Um, now also installed in a fuselage, as you can see here, is a ESC. And this is the ESC which is used to control the tail motor. Um, it's a bit interesting that He-Wing's chosen to mount this ESC inside the fuselage. When I built one of these VTOL aircraft myself last year, I mounted the ESC on the tail boom, so it was outside to get plenty of cooling. Um, but the fact that He-Wing have you know, put this ESC on the inside of the fuselage, I mean, they must have tested it, so they must know that it doesn't get that hot, so it's probably fine. Um, the only other thing that's worth mentioning about the fuselage is that it also comes with a GPS pre-installed. Um, it's a GPS which also includes a compass, and you know, a GPS and a compass is absolutely crucial to having a VTOL work properly. Um, now, a little bit annoyingly, they've decided to put this GPS module in the nose. The reason why that annoys me is because by having the GPS there, it means that you can't mount a HD camera on the front of the aircraft, like a run cam thumb or a Hawkeye thumb. Um, and it also means you can install like an HD FPV system easily either, uh, just because you'd normally put the HD FPV video transmitter exactly where the GPS is. Um, 
Potentially you could try and move it if you wanted to, but you know, for the sake of this build, I just left it where it is. Um, so yeah, that's basically the fuselage. Um, and like, as you can see, you know, most of the wiring here has already been done. So, you know, there's not much left here to do. Um, so let's now move on to the second box. So this second box is the one that contains the tail assembly um, and also just some of the other random bits of hardware. Um, so you've got the vertical stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer, the tail boom, um, the wheels, not that you like to use them, some wooden bits, and uh, a bag of wires as well. Um, most of this is the same as what you get in a generic uh, Hewing T1 PMP kit. Um, but the key difference is, is the fact that on the tail boom, as you can see here, there is a MOSA uh, pre-installed. Um, which is a nice thing to see because you know if you put this for yourself, not only just to you know kind of pre-install that motor, you've got to try and make sure it's perfectly straight and level. But Hewing's already done that for you, so that's a nice touch. And as you can see, they've also already routed the wires down through the tail boom and at the end, um, which is just one less job for you to have to do. Um, as you can also see in this uh, second box, you get this bag of wires here. Um, these are you know, various different wires that you might want to connect up to the flight controller if you want to add additional peripherals or whatever. Um, and there's also crucially this little USB like adapter board thing. So if you want to connect the flight controller to your computer, this is the gadget you use to do that. Um, the only other thing worth mentioning in this second box is there's this random bit of wire here. I'm not really sure what this is. I'm guessing it's uh, some kind of a tool. Um, but there's no explanation anywhere as to what exactly it's for and you know during the build of this aircraft as you'll see in a bit I couldn't find any use for it so a bit of a mystery what this is for but, um, yeah that's basically everything you get in the second box moving on then to the third box as you can probably guess this is the box that has the wings in and um, this is the reason why you know the main box is slightly bigger than the original uh, generic T1 PMP aircraft box. That's because these wings have got the uh, tilt motors and servos pre-installed. Obviously makes the wings a little bit bigger, which is why the box needs to be a little bit bigger. And yeah, I mean, it's just one more thing you don't have to do. You know, on the if you want to build one of these aircraft yourself, you'd have to first take off the original motors, then install these bigger nacelles and the tilt servos and the motors and all that. It's nice to see that he wings already done that for you and all the wiring is already done for that as well. So there's, there's nothing that's left to do. Um, so that's basically everything that you get in the box, fuselage, the tail, the wings, um, and a couple of other random bits of hardware. Now putting the aircraft together, it really wasn't that complicated. The first thing you had to do is you had to route the wire from the elevator servo down through the tail boom, which was quite easy to do. Um, and then you had to just install the horizontal stabilizer onto the tail boom, which you just literally just push those two bits together and kind of twist to click them. Um, and then after that, you then attach the vertical stabilizer, which kind of clicks into place. And then the whole assembly was then secured together using two screws. Um, and those two screws came in one of the bags. I'll put a thing in the corner showing you which one. Um, the only other thing you had to do to then kind of finish off this tail assembly thing was to then just add the servo horn and the clasp to the elevator. Um, and you had to put the clevis and the push rod together and attach that to the servo. Um, once that was done, that was basically the tail assembly completely finished, um, at which point you then had to install it onto the fuselage. This was again very easy. All you had to do was route the wires that were coming out of the tail boom in through the opening in the back of the fuselage. Um, and then you could use this little red nut thing here to kind of secure the tail boom onto the fuselage. Those wires that have then been routed into the fuselage, so three of them were the ESC wires and they literally just connected up to the ESC wires that were already in the fuselage. Um, and they're all color coordinated as well. So um, I think it's the orange one went to the orange one, the black one went to the black one, etc. Um, and the only other wire that, that was then there was the elevator servo wire and that plugged into the only spare port on the flight controller which I think was the one labelled S2. If it wasn't I'll correct myself but yeah I'm pretty sure it was that. Um, and that's pretty much all you had to do to connect the tail to the fuselage. After that you had to then literally just connect the wings um, 
All you had to do there was you had to first install the spar, which went in through this opening here and out the other side. And then the wings literally just slid onto the spar and then clicked into place on the fuselage. Um, after doing that, the only thing you had to do was then install the horns and the little clip things on the ailerons. And again, do the push rod and the clevises and then connect them to the servos. Um, after that, the only thing that was left to do was then to make the hatch. Uh, literally, you had to do is grab the little plastic parts. It's like a handle bit which pushed through the hatch. A little clip that goes on the back. And that was it done. Literally, just installed the rear hatch, installed the front hatch. And that was the entire aircraft put together. Um, and it probably would have taken less than 10 minutes. Um, it took me much longer because I was obviously filming every step. But... Yeah, literally about 10 minutes, if that, to put the entire kit together. Now at this point, the aircraft was almost ready to fly, but it was missing one very crucial part, and that is the receiver. And the one I chose to use is a TBS Crossfire Nano. Um, now for the wiring of this, I literally used one of the wires that came in the bag that came with the accessories. Now, interestingly, this flight controller, like I said, the software, like the programming has been pre-done. Um, and they've actually done the software so that you would plug the receiver into this port here. I can't remember what the port's called. I'll, I'll put it on the screen. But um, yeah, you're expected to plug the receiver directly into this port here. The only problem with that is that amongst all the wires that they provide you in this little bag of accessories, they don't provide you with that wire. <laughs> you're looking for a wire that's got a four pin DuPont connector on it. Um, but they don't provide you with that, which means that there is no wire that you can just use straight away to connect the receiver up to the flight controller. Um, so what I did was end up using one of the other wires. Plenty of wires in this bag that you can use, which have four wires on, which is what you need for Crossfire. So I just took one of those wires, I just cut it to length, I soldered it onto the receiver. Um, and then I just plugged it into the flight controller on this spare UART here. I think it was UART 2. Um, that did mean, as you'll see in a bit, that I had to slightly change the programming to you know, reassign which UART was used for the receiver. But I mean, that wasn't a big deal to do, but it's just something worth noting. Now, obviously, you may use a different receiver um, or something anyway, but I just wanted to just point out that you know, for some reason, Hewing doesn't provide the wiring that's needed to connect the receiver directly to the flight controller as intended. Um, now, I just let the receiver just kind of float around inside the fuselage here. I literally just routed the antenna through the side of the fuselage out towards the rear like that. Exactly the same as I've done on my generic Hewing T1s in the past, and that worked absolutely fine. Um, now, in theory, at this point, you could fly the aircraft. You know, it's, it's technically, it's got everything that you need to fly if you're happy to fly line of sight. Um, but it's the 21st century, people don't fly line of sight anymore. You know, we're all here because we fly FPV, so the only other gear that I installed in this aircraft was some FPV gear. Um, and I won't talk too much about that. I just used some like some old analog FPV gear that I had knocking around in my spares bin. Um, these days I fly HD FPV, but I just for the sake of this video, I just threw in some old analog gear. Um, I can't even remember what the parts are. I'll write it here somewhere so you can see what they are. Um, but basically, yeah, just installed an analog FPV camera in the nose and then the analog FPV transmitter, what I actually did was I 3D printed this little mount here, um, which basically replaces the rear hatch. Um, then I just installed the video transmitter into that. And again, for the wiring for the camera and the video transmitter, I used wires that came included with this aircraft. Um, so I didn't have to provide my own wiring, um, which is uh, very nice. Um, so yeah, at that point, with the receiver and the FPV gear installed, the aircraft was basically ready to fly. Um, but this is the point where I need to now talk to you a little bit about programming. So this aircraft does come with the programming pre-done at the factory. However, I spent a bit of time having a look at it, and I've got to say that it's a little bit basic. Um, what I'll do is I'll put up on screen here a list of all of the sort of programming steps and sort of the various like codes and things that are needed to be done to get one of these aircraft um, basically fully set up and ready to fly. 
Um, and this list is basically the programming steps that I did when I built one of these aircraft for myself last year. Um, now, as you can see, there are quite a lot of steps that are involved in building one of these aircraft. But, but what I'll now do is I'll color code this list. Um, and basically what this is showing you is which steps he wing have done and which steps he wing haven't. Um, so green, this represents all of the things that he wing have done. Um, these are all the steps that have been correctly or near enough correctly programmed on the flight controller. Um, and these are basically the, the complicated mixing um, kind of like programming steps. So these are the ones which are teaching the aircraft how to transition from fixed wing to a tricopter and back again. Um, they're all very, very crucial steps and they are for the most part done correctly. Now the orange stuff, these are things that have either been done but need to be redone um, or things that need to be modified. Um, so for example, like the accelerometer calibration and the compass calibration, um, these had both been done at the factory, but you know, since then the aircraft has quite literally traveled halfway around the world um, so both those steps needed to be redone. Some of the other stuff though, like the receiver UART, as I mentioned earlier on, those are things that had been done technically correctly, but I had to change them uh, to suit the fact that I'd done the wiring a little bit differently. Um, I also had to change the RC map, and that's something that pretty much every user is going to need to change, because um, the RC map is very much dependent on which, which radio they're using. Um, so you'll have to have a look on your radio, see which RC map you're using, and then you'll have to program that in yourself. Um, other things like the OSD, uh, I mean, yes, this aircraft did come with an OSD that had been programmed, um, and you could fly with it, but it was a bit of a mess, so you know, something I changed myself. So um, yeah, the orange stuff is things that just, you know, they're, they're quite basic things, they weren't too complicated, but they did need to just be tweaked, uh, either because I wanted to or because they needed to be. Um, but there's nothing too hard. Now you will just notice that one of these steps is written in pink and this is the only step that I could identify that I think is absolutely crucial that Hewing forgot to do. Um, and that is a fact that during the, like, the kind of radio calibration settings, you need to reverse the pitch. Um, now I don't know whether this is gonna to apply to everyone. Uh, it may depend on which radio you have. Um, by the way, this is an absolutely crucial setting that needed to be done for my aircraft, um, and that step was completely missing. Now, the red stuff on this list, these are all of the steps that He Wing have omitted from the programming. These are all the things that are missing. Um, and crucially, these are all of, pretty much all of the safety features um, that you really would want to have on your aircraft. Now, don't get me wrong, you could fly the aircraft using uh, all of the steps which are highlighted in green and yellow. As long as you did all of the, sorry, orange. As long as you did all of the orange steps and all the green ones are done, you could fly the aircraft straight away. Um, but the reason why that's a bad idea is because none of the safety features are enabled. That's what all the red stuff is. Um, so for example, when you first power on the aircraft, if you've got it configured properly, the aircraft will run a kind of self-diagnostic and it will be checking for things like, is the GPS working? Is the GPS giving reliable information? Is the compass working? Is that being reliable? Things like that. It will just check the health of all the sensors, make sure they're all working the way they should. Um, but because this aircraft arrives with those safety features disabled, you could potentially launch the aircraft, take it up into the air, whilst there's a problem with, say, the GPS or the compass, and you wouldn't know it. Um, at least you wouldn't know it until maybe you tried to use return to home or something and then you found that it didn't work. Um, now obviously that's not very good, is it? Um, you wanna know that your aircraft is gonna come back to you and, and it's gonna fly properly as well and there's nothing weird's gonna happen. So that's why those safety features really should be enabled um, by default. So, um, yeah, before I flew my aircraft, I did amend the programming quite a lot. And uh, basically all I did was I included all of these extra steps, which are color coded in red. I did also slightly tweak some of the steps that were in green, um, the things like the return home altitude. It was already preset, but it was only 15 meters. I wanted to boost it up to 50. Um, but yeah, I did end up modifying the programming quite a lot. 
And that's something that you may want to take into consideration for yourself. If you want to just buy this aircraft and get it in the air quite quickly, yes, you can do that. But you really should probably spend the time to amend the programming to get those safety features uh, basically set up as well, just like I did. Um, so yeah, on the screen, I will just put a list of the exact settings that I used. Um, so if you want to just copy them, you can. Um, and if you don't know how to do RD pilot programming, it's not too complicated. What I'll do is I'll put a link uh, down here or up here somewhere to my build video for this aircraft last year. Um, Cause I did do a very detailed um, section in that video on how to do the programming. And it'll kind of show you how it is you need to input those codes and do the compass calibration, etc. Um, so yeah, that was uh, basically the issue I had with the programming. Um, but with that said, once I got the programming kind of dialed in exactly the way that I wanted, I was then able to take the aircraft out for a flight. And this is where I'm happy to report that when I took it out for its first flight, it flew absolutely beautifully. So the aircraft took off in VTOL mode and I was happy to see that that worked absolutely fine. Um, it was a little bit of a windy day, the day that I was doing the testing with this, but I was happy to see that like the position hole was working really well, that the aircraft wasn't drifting around a whole lot, like it seemed to be quite under control, which is nice to see. And then yeah, once I got it up to kind of the target height that I wanted, I then flicked the switch to transition the aircraft into fixed wing mode. Um, and after about 10 seconds, it completed the transition and it flew as a fixed wing absolutely fine. Um, I just want to mention that with the way that the programming is done, um, when you flick the switch to transition the aircraft, uh, basically there's a 10 second timer and after 10 seconds, if the aircraft hasn't achieved a specific target speed, um, the aircraft will just complete the transition regardless. Um, the reason why there's like a target speed set up is supposed to be a bit of a safety feature, but actually because this aircraft hasn't got an airspeed sensor on it, um, that doesn't work very well. So. Yeah, basically it's programmed to after 10 seconds, it will complete the transition no matter what. And every time I've used it, that's worked absolutely fine. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because you will get a warning on the screen saying the transition hasn't been successful. Um, but yeah, once the aircraft was in fixed wing mode, it actually flew really well. In fact, I was actually surprised at how well it flew. Um, I normally fly with INAV on my aircraft and I've got another T1, which is on INAV. Um, and I actually have to say that I think that this one on RD Pilot seemed to fly a little bit better um, than my iNav version. And this is just using you know, the stock settings. Um, I was actually a little bit surprised at how quickly this aircraft will do rolls. Um, on iNav the rolls are very, very slow and the aircraft loses a lot of height. But this one, it did really, really quick snappy rolls. Um, and the aircraft uh, just, it felt really locked in and really stable. Um, I was just, I felt very comfortable flying it. Um, now I didn't fly it for very long, um, admittedly. Uh, that's because on that day I was just a little bit short of time. But I flew it for long enough, just kind of test, you know, does the aircraft fly happily and whatnot, and it did. And uh, crucially also tested the return to home. And that also worked absolutely fine. Uh, the aircraft didn't do anything weird. It didn't sort of like get lost or you know, spin around on the spot or anything. Um, the aircraft flew home in fixed wing mode, it then transitioned to VTOL directly overhead and then the aircraft slowly came back down to the takeoff point. Um, I will mention that the aircraft was quite slow during the descent and for some reason it stopped a couple of times and just paused for a bit. Um, I'm guessing whilst it's trying to recalculate something. Um, but yeah, the aircraft did, came back down and it landed within, I think it's about a meter of, you know, the takeoff point, which, you know, was pretty good. Um, and this is just a good point to mention that you know, the onboard GPS this aircraft comes with, it seems to be quite decent. Um, you know, it got a good sat lock very quickly, uh, very reliably. And you know, like I said, you know, the aircraft managed to land pretty close to the takeoff point, which you know, was very, very good to see. Um, so yeah, in general, like the flight experience was very good. It was exactly what you'd expect. Um, I mean, there's no sort of like fancy custom pids or anything on this. Like it's all kind of on stock, but even then, it flew very nicely. Um, obviously, if you wanted to, you could tweak the settings quite a lot to get you know, the aircraft flying a lot more refined. But like I said, considering I was flying on a bit of a windy day, I was actually pretty impressed with how well the aircraft flew. I thought it was pretty good.
So yeah, I guess this now brings me to the part of the video where I talk about whether or not I think that this is a good product, whether this is something that you should consider buying. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you're looking to buy a Vito aircraft, which requires very minimal work to get up in the air, I strongly recommend it. Um, there's literally there's not really any real reason not to. Um, as you've seen in this video, it was very quick to put together and you know, the majority of the programming is done. Um, and even the program is missing only took like, like five, 10 minutes to get you know, set up. Um, I reckon you could quite literally, if you wanted to, you could probably take this aircraft out of the box, get it put together, get it programmed and probably get it in the air in about 30 minutes if you really wanted to. Um, and that's really good because last year, you know, when I built one of these aircraft from scratch, you know, it took several days to put together. There was a lot of work to do. Um, so yeah, if you're one of those people that last year sort of thought to yourself like, you know, I'd love to have one of those Vito aircraft, but that looks really complicated. Well, that's no longer the case. Um, you can now just buy one of these aircraft, uh, basically pre-made. Um, and it seems to work very, very well. You know, as you saw, you know, it flew very nicely. Um, so that's really good. Um, so yeah, I would recommend this aircraft. I always try to be honest in my reviews. Um, I think you guys do know that I'm a bit of a fan of the Hewing T1s anyway, so I am maybe a little bit biased. But honestly, if you want a VTOL aircraft, I mean, I can't really think of any obvious reason why you wouldn't want to go for this one. Um, and the price is not too bad as well. Um, I can't remember exactly what it is. I think it's sort of about $300 or something. I'll put it on the screen. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's it's fairly cheap. Um, certainly cheaper than it would have been uh, last year to build one of these from scratch. So, um, yeah, that's basically been my review of this aircraft. I know it's been sort of maybe a little bit basic, but that's because there isn't really a lot to say. Um, you know, the build was very quick and easy. The programming was very quick and easy. Um, and it just flew great, so there wasn't really a lot to say about that either. But um, hopefully you found this video interesting, and if you have please do give the video a like because it keeps the youtube algorithm happy um but other than that i think i've basically run out of things to say now so i will bid you farewell and i will catch you in the next video cheers guys thanks for watching bye